And for lot 100, I have an opening bid of $100,000. 100, and you advance 110,000. Mm. Art market is booming, right? Now. At 120 on the telephone now, 120,000. Let's face it, it's a feeding frenzy, isn't it? 60,000 on my right, at 161, 200,000. The auction houses are having pretty fantastic success. Back in, the on my right, at 230,000. The art market is, is totally unregulated. You're over here, 240, make no mistake. It's against you, sir. It's rife with fraud. You can open the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal almost any day and see some story. It's sort of like the penny stock market in the 1960s. It's kind of fun that way, but you have to pay a lot of attention. The trough is the art market. The trough is what's selling. Going once, going twice, going for third. On the hammer, 270,000. All you're doing is putting what's going down well with the animals at the time. 280, back in. 290. People collect art for all sorts of reasons. Do I hear 300,000? And to find out that what you're collecting last isn't real. 300,000, I will sell. Yeah, I see probably a fake week. But I don't get caught with it. The concept of caveat emptor is alive and well in the US. It's just like your, your mother told you. If it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. So. Like many a good tale, it all started because of a girl. Well, sort of. I saw her across the crowded room. Her soft shoulders, her long neck, her auburn hair, her knowing smile. My friend made the introductions. They both baited compliments out of me. I had to get to know her. I had to have her. And it was then that my friend told me, she's fake. And that's how my eight-year-long journey into the art, life, and crimes of Elmir Dahori all began. Let's say we could find a Modigliani made by Kisling. A Modigliani by Elmir and one Modigliani by Modigliani. And we put these three drawings in front of a group, let's say one is a director or curator of drawings of, a, of the Metropolitan, one is a Swadizan expert, and one is a great art dealer. It could be anyone from Knödler to Pearls or any of the great ones who consider themselves great and experts. And if any of them recognize which one is which, I am ready to make a great gift to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and take a hang it next to some other Modiglianis who are possibly also by me. When you look at the famous forgers, so you look at Tom Keating, who did Samuel, um, Samuel Palmer and Constable, Eric Hibburn, who specialized in doing old master drawings. A fellow named Beltraki and one named Perenni. At a Keon level, very, very talented works. Van Meegeren, of course, who's famous for doing Vermeers. It's nothing new. It's been going on for probably 2,000 years. All these people were pretty much frustrated artists. And so they started to copy other artists' work and passing them off as being by them. Of course, for someone like Elmir, his fakes were so good, people would see them and they wouldn't feel a need to look much further. He's a person who was able to do a, a great deal of, of tricking others to a degree that I think is not possible anymore today. When you have fakers coming out now, you don't have them having passed off a thousand works, you have them passing off a hundred or two hundred works. And I think that's largely because of the new test, also sort of a general uh, suspicion on the part of the art world. So he's sort of a watershed moment for the sort of the history of forgery. To make, first of all, a, a, a point, I don't copy paintings, painters. I paint in a certain style. It could be the style of Matisse or the style of Modigliani, the style of Picasso, the style of 
His forgeries were so good that many people wouldn't recognize them as fakes. A lot of people would look at an Elmir but think that they're seeing a Picasso or a Matisse or a Medigliani or some of the other greats that he faked. His knowledge of art was clearly very good. Technically, he was a good artist, so he could replicate pastiche, uh, other known artists' work. Um, and he knew enough about the market to know how to actually sell it. Forgers want and need to have compelling and believable sounding stories to go along with their fake works. Uh, in his case, Elmir presented himself as a sort of down-on-his-luck aristocrat whose family had fallen on hard times, and he was selling off his collection to help pay his way. Everything what I sold very miserably, the, the, the big money that was made was never made by me. It was always made by the dealers and the people who resold it. What I got for it was a, was a token. Like a lot of forgers, he never identified for anyone all of the works he did. So we may never know how many are out there. I don't think we're ever safe from forgeries, frankly. I think a lot of people have sleepless nights about this, they really do. And the question is, really, have any of them passed into museums? I remember reading Thomas Hoving's book about fakes, and he claims that 40% of all the works that he saw when he was at the Met were fakes, things that were offered to him, 40%. Conservator friends suggest that a full 25% of any one major museum's holdings, including things in storage, are not right. I never offered a painting or a drawing to a museum who didn't buy it. It's probably true that there are some in museums or in the hands of collectors or their heirs today that could be found. How many are still out there? It's a mystery. Expose the man who holds the art world on red, on threads. <laughs> when the art world looks at a, a painting or whatever it is, they, they ooh and ah over it, and they decide that it's fantastic and it's wonderful. When these connoisseurs find out that these pieces are not legitimate, I think there's a certain amount of egg on the face situation. And I, I think that's at that point, they don't want to talk about it because they've made a mistake. It is the ultimate game of cat and mouse, uh, and how purchasers, unwitting purchasers of fake art are supposed to know that, uh, I think raises a lot of very, very difficult to answer questions, and certainly difficult in the legal sense, and something that the law just has to struggle with on, on a case-by-case -case basis. Really, any, any area of crime within, involving art reflects what the marketplace is doing for art. So if Picasso is selling well, you'll find there's an influx of fake Picassos into the market. Now, how they do that, whether they do a direct copy, that's the worst thing they can do. If they do a, a pastiche of an artist, perhaps he's not so well known, perhaps he's second tier of that um, particular area of art, and therefore it's unlikely there's going to be a complete catalogue resume for the art dealer to check on. But it looks right, and hey, it's selling well, and if he takes it if I don't buy it off this person, he's going to take it to a competitor who sure as hell's going to buy it. And I've got somebody who is really interested in buying this particular commodity right now. Dealers go for it. They want to believe it's the desire of wanting to see it right. And this is what the forger and the con man is playing on. Well, the actual art market itself worldwide is about $200 billion a year. That's the, the consumer part of that art market. The largest consumer country in the world for, the, for this type of market is the United States. 40% of the $200 billion market is here in the U.S., uh, almost $80 billion a year. To put it in perspective, if you take the four major sports of the United States, baseball, football, hockey, and basketball, the total receipts each year is about $26 billion. How much of that $80 billion do you think is caused by fakes? The FBI, Scotland Yard, Interpol, we put together some, some estimates as what the possible illicit cultural property market could have been. And at that time, we said maybe $6 billion a year. When we talk about that market, we're not just talking about theft. We're talking about frauds, forgeries, and fakes, as well as theft. And from my experience, what I've seen, probably 75% of that market is frauds, forgeries, and fakes. It is not theft. All you know is you went to a gallery of some repute and bought something with the name Matisse, and it looks like a Matisse, and you spent a lot of money on it. Are you supposed to suspect that maybe it was by Dahori all along? It doesn't want to be a Matisse. It just wants to demonstrate how in short minutes of clothes I can get to Matisse. Clearly, I wasn't the first to be fooled, and probably not the last. 
So I packed up a few questionable works of art that I had acquired and headed to Texas, where apparently one of the greatest cases against Elmir and his associates had been formed by a gentleman of the name Alger Meadows, who had been fooled not once, not twice, but, well, in his own words. Of the 40 paintings I had acquired from the two Frenchmen, 38 of them were fakes. Well, there's different tracks that you need to do. A lot of it is a track that is focused on the paintings themselves and where they're located, and another track is following the forger himself. Visualize a three-legged stool. Those three aspects are provenance, forensics, and connoisseurship. So provenance, is, that's getting to where it came from, yes? Provenance is the history of it. It includes conservation done to it. People emphasize the sale, but they should also focus on the conservation and other things that were done throughout its history. Tell me about the connoisseurship side. Connoisseurship is the oldest of all the practices. It's looking at the painting. Does it correspond with the style of the artist? Does it have that air, that aura, that says this is, this is it, this is the brushstroke, this is the, the content, the subject matter is, is correct. On the forensic side, there's a lot of new developments. A lot of this technology being brought into identifying attributing, authenticating works of art, are technologies that were initially done for other industries. Traditionally, understanding a work of art has been the world of the art historian the curator and with conservators and scientists becoming involved in the museum environment we're finding that conservators have a certain perspective and scientists also can have a perspective that is valid and different and so these three different areas have complementary skills so using that investigative platform how would you go back in now and look at Elmir the master criminal from the provenance side, we would look at dealers in the cities, match them with the cities he lived in, then see if you can find records of their operations. It would say a sales receipt, a purchase receipt. I think a big difference between a forger in Elmir's day and a forger today is Elmir could fake his identity and have an easier time getting away with it. Because, you know, there was no internet, there was no mass media in the same way. So Elmir could present himself in San Francisco and have one alias, then he might be in Texas or Miami with another alias, and he just might not be discovered. I think it's much harder to do that today, but not impossible. On the connoisseurship side, if you deal a lot in those works, you get an eye, you pick up on things, you get a feel for the artist. And so dealers can weed that out. We look for style, signature, medium. The second thing we're going to do is once we document those particular aspects of a painting, we're going to start our research. And the first thing we're going to look for is history. We're going to look at catalog resumes. Is the piece in a catalog resume? We're going to look uh, to see if there's any literary references. We're going to look at exhibition history. Has the piece ever been on exhibition? Is the record of it ever being on exhibition? Thirdly, we're going to look at the provenance. Where did the piece come from? If there's no traceable evidence of acquisition, that does create a red flag. What's your feeling looking at it now? I'd have to say, while the color scheme and the composition do appear similar to Leger's other studies, the actual execution, from a gut feeling, doesn't appear to be in the hand of Leger. You're suspicious? Yes, I, I am very suspicious. Now in the forensics, it's more difficult because a lot of these paints were used by the same artist. In forgeries or something that's been over-restored, people will use something that is not necessarily made at the right time for that artist. So for example, somebody forging a Botticelli painting might have used Prussian blue. That's a blue pigment that wasn't available until several centuries after the artist had died. But on the painting, it looks right, and so they'll, they'll use it. And it, afterwards, scientists can come along and identify that the blue pigment is not azurite or ultramarine as it should be, but it is Prussian blue. And using 
instruments that have helped us identify pigments more carefully. Infrared spectrometry has been developed to a new level and we can take very small amounts of material and collect a very good spectrum and then connect that to a library and we can identify pigments that way. Also at Harvard, we've developed a technique called laser desorption ionization mass spectrometry. And it's a technique where you'll put a, a sample of pigment on a plate, zap it with a laser, and that will volatilize it, put it into a mass spectrometer. And then those um, very complicated organic molecules that are used for modern pain can be identified. And if we want to understand Elmir, don't we have to sort of understand, I guess it would be his MO, why he did what he did? Why not be a real legit artist and why do this life of crime? Yeah. How would we go about that? What would you suggest? Well, if we study um, the person, his profile, his upbringing, his background, mm -hmm. um, his socioeconomic uh, upbringing, where he comes from. It sounds like you're suggesting we go to Budapest. In Budapest, we'll learn about the history of that period in which he comes up. He's, he has an upbringing, he has an art education. You know, what does he do to be able to survive? Like he changes his name. That's very common in Jewish people who went through the Holocaust right. and survived. But that experience is so heavy that it can create a person in a certain mold. And so from that, we'll be able to know him better and understand why it was so easy for him to just turn away from being an artist himself and just flaunt it with forgeries to, to fund a lifestyle. Yet our intention is to find out the truth. Find out the truth and separate the fake from the real. very talented faker uh, who, who had a very adventurous life and who was a very special character. But we didn't know very much about what happened to him when he lived before here in Hungary. His original name was Hoffman Elamir. In Hungarian, we changed the order of the names. We put, put surname first and then we put the given name. At the turn of the century, there was a flourishing artistic colony in Transylvania. It was called the Nagybanya colony. Uh, that, that beautiful, lovely little Transylvanian uh, village. The translation actually of this uh, village is huge mine, Nagybanya. This is a place where later, uh, which Elmir attended himself too, for this was a really controversial time after the First War, until the beginning of the Second World War. Uh, plenty of new art um, unions, organizations were established. Um, a lot of Gichi paintings appeared. There was a huge battle against all these Gichi things that appeared on the market. Uh, and, uh, but also very good works as well. There was also a little revival of avant-gardism. So Amir had lots of lots of uh, inspiration and lots of lots of impact, I think, on his artistic um, yes. character. And perhaps I think this could be a reason why he felt a little bit uh, overwhelmed, or, overwhelmed or, or by maybe, other artists that were better, maybe. Yes, or maybe he felt that the, the level to be reached is too high. Yes. And maybe it's just blocked him, and that's why he turned to faking things and not uh, not living his own artistic career. Or maybe more deeper part of his uh, character, a more colorful and more liar uh, character. <laughs> So this art camp, or we call it art colony, or artist colony, it has a very rich heritage in this country. A very famous artist colonies, like the Nagybanya artist colonies, it was a kind of intellectual circle. And not only the physical space, but the common thinking. But at the same time, trying to, uh, to produce artworks that can be uh, distinguished from other fluence and other way of thinking. 
because everything was basically happening here on the spot. And there is a very more, very important aspect of being a member of a, of a regular artist colony like Najbanya and many others in this country because it, it, uh, it was a kind of brand. As a brand, it gave you prestige. If you belong to a certain intellectual circle, that could give you some more support. To be a forger is a very strange psychological situation. To be someone and to be someone else at the same time. But they need to expose himself. The forgers himself or themselves want to be seen somehow. Not as a forger, but as some of the producer of the work. Elmiad de Hori munkásságával pár évvel ezelőtt találkoztam először, és volt szerencsék megvizsgálni Maklári Kálmán egyik csodálatos darabját, ami egy modélje, Elmír modéljáni nő. A, még ezen kívül pár másik festményt is. A vizsgálatok nagyon érdekes eredményeket hoztak. A, az volt az eredménye, hogy Elmér nem foglalkozott azzal, hogy ő milyen festéket használ, hanem csak a, azzal a meditációval, vagy ezzel a, foly a készítési folyamattal törődött. Yeah, the surface is old. A lot of cracks on the surface and of the color. Sometimes I see some bubbles too. It means this color is not 100 years old. The paint is very creamy. And I'm not able to see small grains inside. When we talk about art and when we love art, we love the history that which is not seen. We love that it was painted by someone who we love. We love Monet, we love Tiziano, we love Picasso. This is a part of this whole things that we, we believe as art. Several times I see uh, artificial aging, flooding, make it dirty, and so on and so on. When, when something suddenly proved to be a forgery, this is an attack of this kind of knowledge and this kind of belief in, in our personality. And this is something that's very, very difficult to, to cure. Forgery must be served as fresh as possible. So the next day is not as good. The original things are, have the same quality every time and uh, gives you new questions. They have new inspirations, even at Tiziano, 500 years old. But you see that, yes, there is still some power. A hair, maybe the hair of the artist here. It's so funny. The forgeries unveil themselves, by themselves, automatically. This is the time. The time executes the, the forgeries after some years. We go step by step and measure each color with XRF gun and later on we got the chemical components. So at first I will measure the red one. So on the red area we, we need to find the phosphor with uh, mercury or red lead. On the white surface cadmium yellow and what is the most important that on the white area uh, it mustn't be titanium white if this artwork was painted with Duran. So it must be lead white a kind of mixture with uh, zinc white. I think that yes in aesthetical sense the perfect forgery can be produced but art historically sense it's impossible. So it's not 100 years old, I'm sure. Now we see, oh, it's very easy to see, yes. It's Erbil de Hori. Why did collectors of the 1950s didn't see that it's bad things? Because they were living at that time and the forgeries were, were prepared for the taste of that time. Yeah, maybe the paper was much more older. I think that even today, even this moment, some corner of the world, uh, good quality forged painting is uh, made. <laughs>
let's say, 50. This painting around 50 or 60 years old. And uh, if someone asks if there are forgeries in a large collection than a Hungarian National Gallery, I would say that, <laughs> as much as I know, today we don't know about forgeries, but there might be <laughs> in 100 years. <laughs> So for me, this whole research was very interesting because when we met, we started to investigate a bit, little bit more deeper. We started to dig a little bit more deeper here in Hungary, in the archives, in, in databases. And that opened another, or maybe more deeper part of his uh, character, a more colorful and more liar uh, character. <laughs> It's a, I'm not sure that it's him, but I can't really imagine that there was a, another Hoffman Elemir at the same time. And it says that um, that um, there was a, the story goes back to uh, the, the last year when there was a huge case that Hoffman Elemir, Elemir Hoffman, the painter, was. Um, was punished by, uh, was was arrested by the police because of stealing something. <laughs> the um, and later against the, this artist, Zita Perza, who was a um, who was the actress of Vixen, as it's a very established Hungarian theater. Yes, we found something very interesting about Elmir in in an archive. Uh, a newspaper article, actually, and it was about a very interesting story that once he painted a portrait of, um, of an actress, and uh, while painting this actress in, in, in the apartment of her family, when he didn't pay attention, he just uh, <laughs> took a few things away. He has stolen a few things away, like silver things and uh, jewelries. And of course, the parents of this actress discovered and discovered that he was a, uh, a thief, basically. And they um, went to the police. The police investigated. They found everything in Elmir's flat, all the silver, all the jewelries. And of course, he was arrested. So funny stories, I think. No? And he told that, uh, well, those were very, very strange times. He, he doesn't exactly remember what happened in those times. Probably it all happened because he was in Serbia when the king was uh, killed. And he was arrested then because they thought he's a spy. And he was even uh, treated with morphine. And even Prince Joseph can tell that it was true because uh, while he was painting his portrait, he was treated with morphine because he was so extremely exhausted and excited and, and, and sick. So, <laughs> and his lawyer asked him to, to um, examine uh, his state of mind, whether he's, uh, he has some psychological problems. And then I proceeded to, to France, to Paris, where I studied under Fernand Léger at the Académie Grand Chaumier. And I must, I must also add that in this article we could read that he was punished and he was arrested before several times, not only in Budapest, but also in London, in Zurich and other European cities. Condamnation. 18 mars, 27, 27, chèques sans provision. 23 septembre, 27, faux, 3 mois de prison. 15 octobre 1927. Six mois de prison, vol. 27 octobre 1928, Berlin. Deux mois de prison pour vol. 28 décembre 1928, Charlottenbourg, Rossel. Ah, ça s'améliore. Février 1929, ça y est, ça commence. Rossel, confusion des peines. 10 mai 1929, idem. Attention, on rajoute une petite escroquerie et un détournement. 21 juin 1929, Londres, infraction à la police des étrangers, vol d'un carnet de chèques, deux mois de prison. 23 décembre 1930, Belleville, 
Faux dans les titres. Délit répété. Usage abusif de pièces de légitimation. Trois mois de prison. 1933. Zurich, escroquerie, faux. Et après, ça s'arrête. Actually, this is something that he denied and told that his passport was stolen and someone under his name committed these crimes. It's incredible. Il a un casier judiciaire de stupéfiants, quoi. Les stupes, ça commence comme ça. Après, ça monte, ça monte, ça monte, puis on les arrête plus, quoi. Oh. When already other people sort of try to get over the Atlantic, I return to, I return to Budapest. Just imagine what it's like. You're in France. War is about to break out. The French are getting a little excited because all of a sudden they realize, well, if it's Germans coming in, then anybody with a Germanic background is going to be suspect, so they're already starting to put people in prison. If Hungary is his home, then the natural thing to do is to go back home. Elmir goes back to Hungary, and Hungary is far away. So technically speaking, it's also a point of escape, and he is a mischievous, opportunistic person based on the background that we've come to know of him, so I think, honestly, uh, it was the right choice for him, and he probably felt that uh, being back in the homestead would uh, allow him to sort of regroup and figure out what the next step would be. The war broke out. And the stories around uh, his staying in his concentration camp are, are very questionable. But clearly, if it's before 1944, then obviously it's the Hungarian authorities. He explains that um, he was injured by his leg. I think his leg was broken and he was sent to hospital. This, this didn't happen in those times. You think that somebody like Elmira might realize that his background could work against him, but it can also work for him. The International Tracing Service is really about anybody who disappeared or who went missing. The fact that we do have so many Hungarian names is predicated both in part because of the Budapest situation, but also because so many deportations occurred. And once you cross the border, quote unquote, and face incarceration in a camp, then your name will surface. In other words, you have to be in a prison, you have to be in a camp. You have to be in a place where you're going to be registered. So we use this card index uh, to see if we could find anything on uh, Elmir's family. Because if we start to look archives, we, we mustn't use his invented name, Elmir Dahori, but we must use, of course, his original name, uh, Hoffman Elmir. Now, they did confirm the mother. They confirmed that he had a family. And also another relative, uh, relative's grave was mentioned in the letter, who was called Adi. But we couldn't go too much beyond that. It's only if he uh, somehow just fell off the radar screen that he wouldn't be uh, listed. Uh, people like Isvan and Elmir at this point were sort of looking at them as a duo um, that uh, enable one another to do things uh, more illicit than licit. And those are the kinds of people, frankly, who uh, wake up interest in uh, intelligence agencies. And if his talents are known even to Isvan, and if Isfahan is close to the Germans for whatever reasons, then that's the kind of message that doesn't go unheeded. Because by the early 40s, AM6, which is really the foreign counterintelligence arm of the uh, German Secret Service, is uh, looking for people like that because they need fake passports, fake visas. And uh, if you have skilled individuals like Elmer who are available, then they're likely to recruit him. I would start to question everything. Who knows? What is it? What, what makes you travel? You want to change the landscape? You want to meet new people? You want to meet new faces? You think you meet somebody more attractive in the next town as you met there? You, know, you never know. Why? Why people travel? Michel Prado, please. Ah oui, bonjour, Michel. Ça, c'est Jeff. Oui. Oui, oui. Nous sommes ici, en Paris. À 4 heures? Oui, merci. À bientôt. L'histoire de Horry, c'est l'histoire de quelqu'un qui se cache sans arrêt. Il est, il est mort en 76, donc on, on peut rencontrer encore des gens qui l'ont connu, ce qui n'a pas été mon cas, mais qui, j'espère, est le vôtre. Mais lui, le jeune homme, il a, il a, de, il a deux problèmes. Il, est, il a envie d'être artiste et il est homosexuel. Donc, il va à Munich 
dans l'espoir d'avoir une plus grande liberté que dans sa famille. Bon, ça marche plus ou moins bien. Il vient à Paris, parce que c'est là que ça se passe. À cette époque-là, en, en 26, c'est là que ça se passe. Et il travaille à, avec Fernand Léger à, à, la, à la Grande Chaumière. Et Fernand Léger est quand même quelqu'un qui lui aussi a fait défaut. C'est-à-dire que quand il y avait une petite ardoise à régler, bah, il copiait quelqu'un, puis voilà. C'était assez usuel entre artistes de, de faire des faux d'un copain. À l'époque de Courbet, euh, il y avait beaucoup de faux. Jean-Baptiste Corot, il avait une usine parce qu'il n'avait pas le temps de répondre à la demande. Donc il y avait des gens qui, avec son approbation, faisaient des faux Corot. Tous les peintres du début du XXe siècle ont tous été copiés. Et il y a aussi eu les, les Van Gogh, quand on s'aperçoit qu'il y a deux versions des, des Iris. Je pense que c'est quelqu'un qui a profité aussi d'une époque où euh, on était beaucoup moins regardant qu'on l'est aujourd'hui, et qui a pu, euh, grâce à ça, euh, prospérer, euh, et aussi avec la complicité de Logro, euh, qui, qui était, lui, beaucoup plus malfaisant que, euh, que, que ne l'était Elmire, euh, qui euh, aurait pu très bien rester dans son coin, à faire, euh, sans que ça ait les conséquences commerciales que ça a pu avoir après sur, sur, sur tout le marché de tous ces artistes. Qui était, une, qui était des conséquences monstrueuses. Quoi. Et je pense que De Horry, qui n'avait rien comme argent, a dû se dire, si Fernand Léger fait ça, si Vlaminck fait ça aussi, pourquoi pas moi Et il s'aperçut qu'en faisant un petit Picasso, qui est quand même plus simple à faire qu'un qu Léonard de Vinci, je peux payer mon loyer, why not A titled Englishwoman walked in one day to my room And she saw on the wall, pinned on the wall, a drawing. I say, hey, where you got that Picasso? I say, well, do you think it's a Picasso? I say, well, I know enough about Picasso to know whether it's a Picasso or not. I say, fine. He said, would you sell it? I say, well, delighted. So she says, well, how much? I can't remember. She said, I think 50 pounds, I think she, she, she offered me. And I did uh, sell it. I didn't feel good about it. She was a friend. But the 50 pounds helped me a great deal because it was the day of the payment for the rent. And I didn't have the money for the rent. Elmir de Horry, he n'avait absolument pas le droit de copier les œuvres de ces artistes uh, imminents. Mais là, c'est prolifique. C'est-à-dire que uh, Elmir de Horry, ils ont copié, copié, c'était un full-time job. Mais nous, on pense quand même qu'il n'a pas le, la créativité. De... C'est-à-dire qu'il ne fait que reprendre des éléments qui sont répandus chez, chez l'auteur de la copie. Le vrai faux <rire> est un travail éminemment complexe qui ne peut être fait que par, de, que par un artiste. C'est en fait la capacité qu'a une personne de se dire... Qu que, quel tableau aurait pu faire le peintre De se mettre à sa place et de sortir une œuvre qui n'est pas évidemment une œuvre originale de l'artiste qu'il essaye de copier, euh, ou de falsifier plutôt, le terme doit être plus juste, mais qui euh, reproduit l'idée que l'artiste aurait pu faire s'il avait été à sa place. Voilà, ça, ça n'existe pratiquement pas. Les faussaires sont souvent des gens qui font des patchwork. Alors ça, sur Modigliani, on en a beaucoup. Euh, C'est-à-dire, en gros, ils prennent un bout d'un tableau, un bout d'un autre, un bout, etc. Ils, font, ils mettent le tout ensemble, ils jouent avec ça, et boum, voilà. Ça, c'est typiquement, le, 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 je dirais, c'est le faux standard. Mais ce n'est pas le vrai faux. Le vrai faux, c'est, en gros, vous êtes un faussaire, vous voyez un sujet, vous dites, tiens, je vais peindre ça, comment l'aurait peint Modigliani et faire en sorte qu'il ressorte exactement... Il faut se mettre dans la peau de l'artiste, complètement. Je dois le mettre dans le frame, mais c'est très rigide. Donc je pense qu'il y a peut-être un autre canvas attaché à ça, qui me permettrait de voir le bas de l'original. Oui, c'est très rigide. Et vous voyez, il y a cette espèce de fond en train de se tourner mal, si un painting est flaqué, si c'est été terriblement buckled, crimpled up, to put it back in a single plane to consolidate the paint film. Linings have also been done um, 
perhaps to disguise the back of the original painting. Let's take a look in ultraviolet light to get a good look. Um, the varnish is fluorescing, which indicates it's been on there for a while. Uh, if it's been in a restorer's hands, this might well be the restoration varnish. It's uneven. And the hair, the pigment in the hair, fluoresces the same way the signature does. So it certainly suggests that it is similar paint to that hair. D'avoir le même talent que Monigliani, après tout. En faisant des faux Picasso, en faisant des faux Dufy, en faisant euh, des faux Van Dogen. Enfin, il était extraordinairement prolixe, ce monsieur. Il était extraordinairement doué dans tous les registres. Matisse, euh, enfin bon, il avait euh, plusieurs cordes à son arc, je dirais, artistiquement parlant. Now, we do think this is a, a Elmer de Horry. Oh. Um, it is very good. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, however, to ultimately fool the eye even more, yes. this is passed off as a print. If you look at this image, you'll see lines and they form a very pleasant face yes. of a woman. And what else do you see? Oh, we see a signature. Yeah. We see it's a series. Mm -hmm. It says 23. 50. Okay, so the addition is 50. There's 50 in existence, and this yes. is the 23rd. Now, lithographs yes. are is a printmaking technique. If you think of a Crayola crayon yes. dragged across a paper with texture, what happens to the little bits of Crayola crayon? Oh, they stay on the paper. Little on the high, on, yeah, the on the high, high points, on yeah. the high points. When you're drawing with a wax crayon, the longer you draw, yeah. the softer the wax gets and the darker the line. So what you generally see is an accumulation of more and more crayon onto the surface of the paper. So let's follow this line down. Matisse drawings line were never that sure as mine. He was hesitant. These are very that's, long, complex that's lines. Big, yeah, that's a Look at that. long line. That is a long line. And it's a lot of confidence the, the, in doing that yep. with that with starting it and finishing it. You think you understood that? This is this line right here. Oh, that went on for a yeah. while. And you can see it ends over here just when yeah. it gets really warm. Yeah, yeah. That's a very confident hand. That's extremely confident hand. Je suis pas sûr qu'elle mirait cette capacité. Peut-être il l'avait. Encore une fois, on reconnaît un Elmire de Horry très vite. Enfin, en ce qui me concerne, j'en ai vu beaucoup, donc je 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 sais voir. I want to write uniquely and exclusively of my work. And I think my work is good enough and that's serious enough to give pleasure and joy to the people who will acquire them. But he has always this problem, too, with him, always, of homosexuality. It's something that he will follow all his life. He's obliged to leave certain places because he has des histoires de, des histoires de garçons. Yes, there are too many girls. They have to put up with how many? One, with two, three, four, five, two boys and five girls, you know? It's, a hard, the, uh... it's a hard profession. <laughs> I met Elmir in Palm Springs, California in 1964. I was involved with Sasha Brastoff, very popular in Southern California, and most known for his ceramics and his jewelry, gold jewelry and that, and uh, Lee Liberace, the pianist. And Howard Shu, the high style fashion designer for MGM, and also for Judy Garland, did all of Judy Garland's costumes for the Judy Garland television series. The three of them had a gallery called the Esplanade in Westwood, California. It was kind of like the in gallery at the time, mainly because of the namesakes of the ownership. We had one of the most unique meetings with Elmir at a little restaurant called the Matador, a little Spanish restaurant, which was a favorite hangout for a lot of celebrity people in that. And um, the meeting was based on the idea of Elmir having an exhibition of his own work at the Esplanade. Very unexpectedly in that meeting, in the conversations, uh, the idea of his reputation being affiliated with fake or fraudulent art had come up in conversation. 
prior to that, I had no true knowledge of it or anything. But you know, as a an art collector, art dealer, art appraiser, and so forth, I, I kind of related to that portion of that conversation very deeply. And I thought, my goodness, isn't this something? Et finalement, il y a, quand il revient, mais c'est vers 40, euh, 40, 50 ans qu'il revient euh, à Miami. Well, I was first introduced to Elmira Johori's work as a little girl when I would visit mother's friends in Palm Beach or perhaps Miami. And it just seemed every great house had a Johori or two juxtaposed amongst all of these other fabulous collections of authentic, original paintings. And I was a rather brazen, curious, outspoken child, and I had to be, have my enthusiasm curbed, so to speak, you know, to not be so terribly rude as to ask which one is the Dahori, which one is the fake. Il est très déprimé. Il essaie de, de se suicider. Et à ce moment-là, c'est un autre, euh, un autre faussaire qui lui a bien la tête sur les épaules et qui, qui est un, un maître, Fernand Le Gros, qui va le sauver. Il est homosexuel comme lui. Ils sont tous les deux très tous les deux faussaires, mais Le Gros euh, a eu un culot, une assurance incroyable. C'est évident qu'il y avait, à mon avis, dans cette affaire, la tête de la bande, la tête pensante, je dirais, le cerveau. C'est un type quand même qui a un coup de génie dans sa vie. Il arrive en Amérique avec des valises pleines de tableaux imités, mais pas signés. Et quand les douanes lui demandent « Mais qu'est-ce que c'est, Monsieur Le Gros ?», il dit « Ah, ça, c'est rien, c'est juste des copies. » On lui dit « C'est pas possible, c'est pas possible. » C'est forcément des vrais tableaux. Et ce sont les douaniers eux-mêmes, les douaniers américains, qui lui donnent des certificats d'authenticité pour tous ces tableaux. Du coup, ça multiplie par 100 la valeur de ces tableaux et le gros, avec la... grâce aux douaniers, peut se faire une fortune avec ses valises. Le cerveau, c'était Fernand Le Gros. Le Gros a une assurance. C'est un... un levantin, comme on dit. C'est un homme d'Orient. Il... il porte des manteaux de fourrure, il a des colliers d'or, des lunettes, il roule en Rolls une grosse barbe, enfin, c'est un très tapageur. Mais enfin, la police commence, la police, quelques collectionneurs qui se réveillent un peu tard, commencent à s'apercevoir que c'est peut-être pas tout à fait, bon, tout à fait exact ce qu'il ce qu leur a vendu. Fils le coin au, au, au Mexique, je crois. Et il continue à vendre un peu par correspondance, parce qu'il faut vendre à des gens qui ont de l'argent, évidemment. Elmer offre une chance de regarder comment les décisions ont été faites and to understand where, th where we might have gone wrong, where a forger can get in there and take advantage of a certain system. Angus Mongan was somebody who started at a junior level in the museum and worked her way up to eventually be the director of the museum. In a world at that time that was dominated by men, she was an important female figure and an inspiration for many. She had these, these drawings that were in her collection Um, she had access to the conservation department and all the facilities there. What the drawings had was that they, they were made of materials that were all available to the artist. And so any scientific approach to try and identify the materials used on the drawings would not have yielded any evidence whether they're real or not. Again, they, 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 they contain the veneer of something that looks genuine, but when you spend a lot of time looking at them, there's something missing. In this instance, it's the connoisseurship leg of the stool that came away and unbalanced this, this tripod. You know, she had the eye, you know, she was able to look at these and say, there's something wrong with these drawings, they don't look right. Et le gros qui a été rejoint par un Canadien, ben son, son, jeune, son, son jeune amant qui s'appelle le, le Réal Lessard, va fabriquer des, des faux tableaux, les vendre et faire des affaires. Le cerveau, c'était Fernand Le Gros. C'est lui qui avait les idées, c'est lui qui menait euh, sa petite bande, qui cloisonnait euh, euh, d'un côté Elmire de Horry, de l'autre côté euh, Réal Lessard, euh, qui les faisait travailler. Eh bien, le Gros, à un moment, trouve que ce qu'Elmire 
est un peu voyant, un peu gênant, donc il va l'envoyer en Australie pendant un an. If we, at first glance, as, yeah. as we look at this, our eyes immediately make the connections, recognize the image, yeah. and it says to us, this is, this is Matisse. In fact, here's Matisse right He's back here, corner. looking in. And uh, this, this, would, this is a very exciting drawing for, yes. for that. And it's, it's signed, Henri Matisse, 1935. Everything is right about it in terms of materials. The ink is right. It, he used a dip pen. Um, the characteristics of the lines are are correct. It is on a, an artist paper okay. um, that is like the uh, paper used by by Matisse, and we do oh, have well, on the back. we do have a watermark on here too, right here. We know that Matisse did use MBM France paper. However, yes. there is a little red flag here. Yes. Here we go. J. Perigo would appear was never used by Matisse. Interestingly enough, Perigo Arche was sold in Australia. Oh. Oh. C'est très intéressant parce que il savait s'adresser avec Fernand Le Gros et et avec Réal Le Sart, il s'adressait à une population euh, toujours adaptée. Il amenait des Dufy aux États-Unis. Il amenait des Matisse à Caracas. Enfin, il s'adaptait, mais vraiment, c'était des hommes euh, d'un intérêt financier extraordinaire. Ils étaient à Proguin. Ce sont juste des gens à Proguin. Je pense qu'il a bêtement à ce qu'il lui disait, « Mais euh, fais-moi des petits Dufy, on est dans la merde, là. On est dans la merde. Fais-moi vite des Dufy. » Et puis, il allait les vendre à une pauvre comtesse I grew up in a castle, so there must have been lots of it. We've got a few Modigliani's. I've got a Marie Laurenson, which I think you've seen. I've got a couple of Dufy's. And uh, a Picasso, which I don't think masters it. <laughs> and a lady here, who we can't mention, she bought a huge collection. And then, when they had a few problems, somehow or other, I ended up with the collection at a price. But as you know, he didn't make much money doing his own stuff. So then, whoever it was started making him not copy, but make one more. So let's say there are 100 Picassos. There must be 150 nowadays. But they're fakes, aren't they? They're not forgeries, because they're not copies. They're just one more. So, like, if you if you feed painted 20, now they're 50. <laughs> I mean, he didn't he didn't copy precisely, but I mean, as you well know, he used the right paper, he used the right whatever had to be. But he was brilliant, I think. I don't know. And they say, oh, he never signed Dufy or Picasso. That's rubbish. Probablement plus amoureuse de Fernand Le Gros, qui avait l'air d'être un beau séducteur. Il était proche des veuves des artistes. Some of the widows still were alive and they knew they were not even aware of what the husbands had done and he would just pay them a little bit and then they would just sign a document saying, yes, my husband painted this. And that was it. It was not that much research. Le Gros, qui commence à être poursuivi lui aussi, installe Elmire à Ibiza. Et Ibiza, qui n'en est pas encore le l'île merveilleuse que tout le monde connaît, que Barbet Schroeder a filmé. Le seigneur Mir vino à Ibiza et se estableció allí. Et se estableció probablemente vecino à une propriété mia en Villa Pratero. Emir, comme il était une personne sensible, une personne agradecida, era une personne avec un grand goût, mais surtout, il était un grand théâtre. Il paraissait qu'il était faisant du théâtre, toujours, qu'il était toujours ante les caméras, il était très bien vêtu, généralement, et pour moi, l'idée est qu'il était un grand histrion, un grand comédiante. 
¿eh? pero sabía vivir la vida como si fuera una comedia. Así, parte a Ibiza. Así, moi. When I came to Ibiza for the first time, the reason was, in the times of Franco, there was a lot of repression. Uh, here was a place with total freedom, completely virgin, very poor, very poor island, but because of poverty, it was absolutely beautiful. We were living without electricity and running water in the country. Ibiza, nobody knew about it, really. It was like, to get there, the access was like, you know, you would fly in a little plane, the airport was a tiny hut. The place was so beautiful and so utopian that everybody had the need to create something out of that. There was, it was quite extraordinary. And in those days, in the 60s, you had, um, what you had at Franco was alive. So you had basically all the criminals who were being sought after by Interpol, whatever, living in that island. You had Nazis, you had uh, con men, you had everything. And um, in fact, you know, uh, the police force in, in the island were dressed in remnants of the Africa Corps. Because Spain in the, in the 60s and 70s was, you know, church and uh, it wasn't like it is now. They were like 40 years behind. The group of people in Ibiza was called the family. They were all black sheep escaping from our families. And we created the family here. It was a beautiful island. It was a, it was a wonderfully magic time, actually. And it was a fantastic time. In retrospect, it seems incredibly innocent. One of my uncles had a lover called Ángeles de la Vega. When I arrived to Ibiza, there was a woman, she's still alive, called Arlene, an American woman. She opened El Bar La Tierra. It would be a little bit like Rick's in Casablanca. You'd see yeah. people there you knew from all over the world. The bar was fantastic. It was the meeting point after dinner. It was run by a, a Jewish American lady named Arlene Kaufman. She spoke Spanish impeccably, grammatically, but with a Brooklyn accent. So it was. Oye, Juan, por favor, try to me, okay, yo? I mean, it was... And she was a fantastic DJ. Not chumba, 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 but I mean, the best music you ever heard was Arlene in La Tierra. The first day I arrived to, to Ibiza, of course, I go to La Tierra. Ángeles de la Vega, she had a bar next called La Sirena Gorda, the fat mermaid. She was fat also. Come, sit down, let's talk. Then I realized she was the, the lover, had been the lover of my, of my uncle, Oliveras de la Rosa. I was really young and looking quite good. So she took me to Elmir's house as a sexual present. I wanted to kill her. I arrived there, completely naive, I didn't know her. Elmir already was, he always looked like a very old man me, you know? I never met Elmir very young. He had white hair, small, with glasses sometimes, you know. And um, I remember there was like a sculpture, a white sculpture of a mermaid with a, with a male sex. And I was waiting like this and suddenly I realized I was against that funny sculpture. What? No problem? Um, Elmir understood perfectly that I was not going to be there for what Ángeles thought. And we became good friends. Elmir's house in La Favez was very beautiful. And he invited me to his villa, his rented villa in Ibiza, which uh, I really enjoyed. And the funny thing about staying there was that you never saw him early in the morning because his routine was to get up at dawn and there was one, it was like a sort of garage, and he used to work in there, and the one thing was banned. He made it very clear you were not allowed into that room. That room was a secret. And that's why he painted, you know, until about lunchtime. There were a lot of artists in Ibiza in those days. That was a very, it was very much a center of activity, of creative activity. There was a lot going on. And then he would go down to Ibiza town, where he was a great character. People loved him and you know, he would sit at his favorite bar and have a coffee and people would say, hi, Elmer. And he had always a, a court around him in, 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 in the Montessori. We met him in that cafe. 
whatever the cafe is called, in Ibiza. This was a picture that Elmir did when we were both in uh, Ibiza town, and he was sitting at a cafe, as he always did, particularly on a Saturday morning. And, um, you know, I suddenly noticed he was doing a drawing, and it turned out that he was sketching me with this rather ridiculous hat. And, um, and afterwards, he, get, you know, he tore it off and gave it to me, and I'm rather proud of it. Always when he was having a, a drink there or a, a coffee or lunch, there was a lot of people sitting uh, around him. So tomorrow the party is a big party, so don't miss it tomorrow at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. And he was inviting everyone who would like to have a drink or whatever. whatever. It was incredible. He was adorable. He was very small, and he had a mind of his own, as you well know. He was he was giving a fabulous party. Everybody was received like a princess, and 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 and, and you, you 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 were living in another world. Of course, they have they had no no money problem. Everybody wants to eat. He liked to play with people from a, like European aristocracy. They were the people who really knew who he was, and he knew who they were, and somehow that was his playground. He enjoyed being with those people. That's who he wanted acknowledgement from. Well, because he knew the whole French community in, in Ibiza. He knew Jacqueline de Rive, he knew my uncle, Fred de Cabrol, he, uh, he knew Guillaume de Polignac, and he had many friends. He had Ursula Andrus, who was a very good friend of his. Uh, he knew Roman Polanski, who was a very good friend of his. Uh, Fernando Rey, the actor. I used to see him with a lot of friends, like Count Jacqueline de Rive, which was nominated more most elegant woman in the world. La Fausse Princesse Milia Mihailovic, La Comtesse de Rive. Clifford, la femme de Clifford Rive. Moi avec La Fausse Princesse. Milia Mihailovic was an incredible personage. I mean, a very good friend of Elmir, but it was fantastic because Smilia was married to a taxi driver. When she comes here, and we don't know why she comes here, she pretends she's a princess. But they used to talk or in Hungarian or in Yugoslavian, and they were insulting each other. It was fantastic. I remember the, uh, her saying, Jevo tipas mater, Jevisela, it's like, fuck you, I don't tell, to him. And in French, she, he was saying, princesse de mon cul, princess of my ass, you know. It was incredible because they're very good friends, but they were fighting all the time. He didn't seem to care a great deal about the art scene that was going on. I mean, he was interested, but it wasn't wasn't like he was going to be a participant in it. Y entonces todo mundo se enteró. Nuestra posición con el Mir es una posición mm, compleja, porque el, el Mir es un personaje complejo. Y debe ser tratado, yo creo que de una manera específica. Eh, la figura del Mir me parece una figura fascinante desde el punto de vista humano. El hecho de que él inventara cuadros, no copiara, sino inventara cuadros de artistas anteriores, famosos, conocidos, colgados en los museos, me parece genial. Pasha organiza una uh, party para el cáncer. Y hubo una auction and Elmir gave us a painting. And the, the painting is in the book of Pasha, you know, the photo with him, and the painting is quite ugly because he was fantastic a la façon de Picasso, a la façon de Chagall, a la façon de Matisse, fantastic. But when he was supposed to do something, it was for flowers and not very good. But there's some forgers who can copy very well, and then they have their own style. He didn't have his own style. I think he had an extremely profound understanding of what other artists had done. I don't think he had the same desperate need or commitment to realize that in himself. But the fantastic thing of Elmir, he was unique in this world, he was inventing. I mean, and you see, this is a Matisse, this is a Picasso, this is a Chagall, this is a Renoir. Even Picasso would have said, this is mine. When I started working in this museum, 
El Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Ibiza es uno de los primeros museos de arte contemporáneo que se fundan en España, que en los fondos del museo había dos cuadros del MIR, un falso Degas y un falso Picasso. Mi idea fue, bueno, vamos a colocarlo, porque la gente tiene la, el derecho a llegar a Ibiza y encontrar que en el museo hay el MIR, porque vivió en Ibiza, etc. Entonces lo pusimos en esa parte un poco vamos a decir, de tránsito, zonas de confrontación que yo llamo entre lo que son las salas de exposición temporal o permanente, entonces ya no se convierten solo en piezas de museo, se convierten en piezas filosóficas para pensar sobre ellas y sobre el hecho de que muchas veces, si me permites el dilatarme un poco en la explicación, es que está puesto al lado de un cuadro de Goya, que no sabemos si es de Goya. <risa> Hay un juego ahí, nuestro, del museo, porque es un Elmir, está claro, está firmado, pero es un falso de Ga. Al lado de un cuadro de Goya, que tampoco sabemos seguro si es de Goya, yo creo que sí es de Goya, <risa> pero no se sabe seguro. Yo no soy una especialista, ni en Goya ni en Elmir, <risa> pero dije, bueno, vamos a investigarlo. La investigación fue muy larga y yo di una conferencia hablando de por qué a mí me parecía de Goya, pero el, lo importante no es eso ahora, sino el hecho de que al final yo pusiera ese cuadro junto al Elmir, porque con eso presento las obras diciendo qué es lo falso, qué es lo verdadero, qué es lo legítimo. ¿Es el cuadro de Goya realmente de Goya? Y si no es de Goya, ¿qué importa? ¿Realmente eso es lo importante? Si el cuadro es fantástico, es fantástico, sea de quien sea. Pasa lo mismo con el MIR. El cuadro es divertido, es fantástico, es genial la historia. Por tanto, la idea de falso, la idea de verdadero, es una idea interesantísima desde el punto de vista de un historiador, pero también de cualquier persona, para pensar muchas veces si es falso o si es verdadero o si hay algo por encima de eso, que es la historia fantástica que late debajo y que legitima, inclusive, la falsedad. Entonces ya no se convierten solo en piezas de museo, se convierten en piezas filosóficas, casi metafísicas, para pensar sobre ellas y sobre el hecho de que muchas veces es algo que debe ser considerado, pero no es lo más importante. Dibujaba tan bien que tenía que dibujar con la mano izquierda, porque con la derecha le sabían demasiado perfectos, más que muy bien y los dibujos. O sea, para mí era un gran artista. Sometimes in art, talent is the first thing that has to be transcended. It's when you go beyond your talent and you go beyond what you know or what is known that it starts to become meaningful and starts to become yo he visto pintar dibujos y rápidamente y con cuatro trazos geniales. Bueno, hubo una, de repente una demanda de extradición de Francia sobre una falsificación y fue cuando las autoridades judiciales, y visto en un sitio pequeño, eso trascendió. A brief time. After, when, you know, when, when he was on the papers and all that, I don't remember in what year, but then, then they knew. Y entonces incluso estuvo detenido unos días por esa cuestión con unas peleas que había tenido con sus socios, el señor Le Gros y el señor Besar. I don't think he knew his paintings were going to museums as fakes and all that. And when he finds out, I think it's when the bad things started. His work was at, you know, in the collection of Algar Meadows and the pearls, and, you know, it's like all scattered around. Not as Elmire's. No, not as Elmire. Oh, Mr. Meadows, how did you happen to get into French modern art, and where did you start buying that? In, uh, in 1961, my wife passed away. In 1962, I married my present wife. On our honeymoon, which lasted about six months, our first stop was Paris. We went to several galleries. 
and looking for Raoul Dufay's. And we found about seven altogether, six or seven, and we bought them all. Well, besides buying in galleries, did you get paintings any other way? Well, you, you mean about the two Frenchmen? <laughs> That's another story. Dès que le séquestre des 10 peintures aura été levé, les 38 tableaux au syndicat de la propriété artistique, 12 rue Honneur... Il n'existe plus Non, ça n'existe plus depuis des années. Qu'à partir de ce jour, ces tableaux ne sont plus la propriété de M. Meadows. En 1964, ma femme m'a à l'office there some paintings they had for sale they had brought from Paris and they want to come at four o'clock and you come home early said the very idea you wouldn't invite peddlers or strangers into our home and I know I won't come home at four but I did come home at six and the dealers were there And they had, uh, from the back of the car, they had taken out uh, some six, uh, five or six uh, paintings and had them standing all around the car. And so they introduced themselves and they appeared to be gentlemen. And I said, well, since you came anyway, bring the paintings on in the house. Et pour la deuxième, il a voulu faire cette collection d'art impressionniste. Les impressionnistes, ça se vend aussi avec des authentifications. Et je sais de quoi je parle, <rire> pour le coup. Yes, they had certificates signed by uh, experts appointed by the French government to authenticate such paintings. And besides, they had evidence that they, these particular paintings had been purchased from one of the outstanding auction houses in, uh, in uh, this country. I met Mr. Meadows through uh, an American attorney. I don't remember if he signed uh, his complaint before the exam, before the French uh, justice. Uh, through me or through the U.S. counselor. Uh, what is clear from what you gave me is that it was filed against X, which means uh, for the U.S. it would mean Mr. AYZ, yeah? Right, Mr. Smith or Mr. something, John Smith, Doe. Yeah, John Doe, exactly. And why do you do that? Why? why would Because uh, uh, there's two ways to trigger uh, an examination by uh, an examining judge. One way is to do it against a designated party, in which case you have to file a bond. Right. If you file against X, then it's up to the French examining judge. The examining judge is going to investigate the case, uh, will decide uh, whether or not John Doe is going to stand trial. Art cases are, they cause problems for the courts. The courts are not fans of having to decide art authenticity cases. Ultimately, any case you're going to be able to uh, bring in, in any kind of court, it's going to have some proof of fraud. And so you're going to have to prove the elements, uh, same as in any other case. A loss of, uh, some type of loss of profit or loss of money, uh, something valuable. Uh, the dependence on the information to make that decision. And, and the victim. So those are the things you're going to have to show. And, and in the case of Elmira at the time, that's what uh, Meadows would have had to prove in his court proceedings. So for a judge or to come in and, and say, I think this work is or is not authentic, has ramifications. And courts don't want to be, they don't want to make those ramifications. They don't want to be market makers, particularly for something that they feel uncomfortable analyzing. For the next two years, They came to Dallas 10 or 12 times, each time bringing different paintings. And uh, you kept buying? I kept buying. Uh, did you buy two and three, four at a time? Two, three, four, sometimes eight. What kind of money are we talking about here? Well, uh, the, first, the first deal was perhaps uh, $70,000 or $80,000. Altogether, $600,000 perhaps. 
think there was an international search warrant. Le Gros, I believe, was uh, arrested in, in Switzerland. Huh? Interpellé, Fernand Le Gros, en Suisse. Il fallait donc qu'il défère un mandat, qu'on lui dise, bah, vous venez être entendu par le juge. Et puis, s'il ne voulait pas venir, bah, on ne pouvait rien faire. Quand vous avez un international warrant, il y a une coopération entre les deux États. Particulièrement intéressé, c'est l'absence de coopération d'un certain nombre de pays. Le French a demandé que Le Gros soit extradé de Switzerland. J'ai comme le sentiment qu'il y a eu une volonté de supporter Fernand Le Gros. Oui, la Suisse a un système similaire à le French, et vous pouvez être mis temporairement en jail ou obligé de rester dans un hôtel. Until such time as the Swiss authorities will make a decision. Je veux dire supporter dans le sens où on punit ou on supporte. Then even the French courts at that point are still having to continue a petition. Yeah, that's not yeah. guaranteed. No, no. Et j'ai le sentiment qu'en Suisse on a préféré faire avec lui. Voilà. Euh, Peut-être parce que il y avait beaucoup de Suisses qui avaient acheté. Euh, des œuvres qu'il avait diffusées et que ça aurait peut-être été un énorme scandale. Et moi, étrangement, je ne me souviens pas de lui qu'il avait le français qui était vraiment directé contre Le Gros. Parce que jamais on ne peut pas démontrer qu'il falsifiait un quadro. Parce qu'il se pintait la manière de... Y otro ponía la firma y no se podía, no se había probado nunca que la pusiera él. En España no, no tenía ninguna responsabilidad y yo creo que en Francia habría tenido poca. It's not illegal to paint something in the style of another artist. Where you cross the line is if you sign that artist's name and you're not that artist. I don't think he knew his paintings were going to museums as fakes and all that. And when he finds out, I think it's when the bad things started. Well, we found uh, some records that show that Elmir had a painting lent to a friend who decided to put it on consignment with Nodler. What we do know is that the forgery by Elmir de Khoury was sold for $60,000 in 1958. Nodler is, it's, it was the oldest and most prestigious gallery in, in America. Prestige, I guess, is, is a qualitative term, but certainly by many accounts. Look at, look at. Expose the man who holds the heart of Andrés. Andrés. <laughs> People who were not giving a, a shit in Ibiza about, about what Wilmer was doing. He was very well liked in Ibiza because he was an outlaw. He enjoyed his celebrity a great deal. And the fact that it was based on notoriety didn't seem to phase him. Il est un embarrassement profond pour à tout le monde de l'art. He started doing the same painting. I mean, he would do a Degas or a whatever, you know, Amadigliani. And he would sign their name, and then he would sign by Elmir, so that he couldn't be charged with fraud and selling a fake. But at the same time, uh, it, was, it was a real fake. It was authenticated by his own signature. He became a star overnight with his with his wonderful um, pictures. Picasso would get for something like that of uh, uh, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. I would sell it for less. In years to come, he said to me when we were walking down past the Royal Academy, he said that you'll find an Elmia in nearly every major collection in the world. Los tres últimos años. He hizo un contrato con el señor Claude, Isidro Claude, que me compraba toda su producción. Y se la compraba sin firmar Matiz ni Modigliani, no, ni firmar Mir tampoco. Y este señor se quedó con las 300 últimas obras, cuadros sin firmar. No se ha sabido más. Y ese es el gran misterio para mí que hay hoy sobre eh, el Mir. 
I would like to see that poor Hungarian refugee who would have resisted of that, of that temptation. En insécurité, plus ou moins recherché par la police euh, espagnole pour être traduit en justice, enfin extradé vers la France. But all his life he was on, in flight and running away and from the police, but he was running away from the people he was involved with, like Fernand Le Gros and two other art dealers who were after him. Do you know anything about those threats that he, he perceived, at least? Well, uh, I remember when they, they killed his dog. They hang him on a tree, and uh, I think they, they have a paper saying the next, the next will be you. The señor Mir se ganó la enemistad del señor Begros, y y el señor Begros lo tenía realmente aterrorizado, y él estaba convencido de que si iba a, a, a Francia y lo metía en la cárcel aunque fuera 24 que el señor Begros tenía bastante poder para matarlo. I mean, he was like really cornered. And one day El Mir arrives like usual to the terrace of the Montesol with his Ibifenko bag and saying, Bonjour, je vais me suicider. Bonjour, je vais me suicider. We thought he was making a joke. I had breakfast with him the, the day before he died at the Montessor. And he said, I mean, it, we all knew then that they were trying to extradite him and stand charges again. And he said, no, I will never spend another day in jail. He said, if, they, if I know they're coming for me, when they make the decision, if they're coming for me, I'll kill myself. They will not get me. And he did. I think after many years of running and away from the law and the lawyers and, and, and people who wanted to, to hurt him, and I think he had just a moment of panic, and I just... Eso unido a un espíritu depresivo que era él, que era a veces muy optimista y a veces muy pesimista, hizo que se eh, tomara la, la, la fatal combinación que lo mató. It's a shame because, you know, he was really, I mean, he was not going to be jailed or, or extradited. Oh, even some people say uh, Elmir did not die and he escaped. The rumor is he was trying not to go to jail and pretend as a suicide and then, then the ambulance will arrive and he would be okay. Y hoy está enterrado en, en la tumba, en el panteón de un primo hermano mío. Sí, lo he visto. They have to be somewhere. Normally, the the forty-four works that were were failed should have been destroyed. This is mean that there is few of fake on the market. That's incredible. Incredible. I don't think Elmir gets any great pass just by saying, you know, what I did was really good and therefore it's beautiful, so it's art. If he, if he really believed that, he could have signed everything to Hori. I feel that we should burn it. We burn everything but myself. <laughs> It's been said that beauty is truth, and truth beauty. But doesn't Elmir's work blur that line? His works were his own creation, executed brilliantly in the style of. At the very least, doesn't his life demonstrate him to be undeniably a true original? But perhaps what is most troubling is that we are left to judge, exercising our own moral compass, empowering our own aesthetic, to offer opinion on beauty, truth, value. We may never know how many works he created during his career, nor how deeply they have penetrated galleries, museums, private collections. And we have no way of truly anticipating his continued impact on the art market. But one thing is certain, 
Elmir de Hori, will forever influence how we look upon art. And in that, he has ensured himself a page in art history as an accomplished, celebrated, real fake. Watch your play.